Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is time to begin services today, so if you all please take your seats. We will begin here. Uh, it certainly is wonderful to have everybody back together again. It is uh, a beautiful day outside here. There's so many that are uh, looking down the storms that are moving on shore down in uh, Florida today, but uh, certainly hope that God will see uh, see mercy on them and, and whatever his great will will be. Um, I certainly know that there's been many in the Houston area and of course down in uh, Mexico with the uh, earthquake down there that have uh, been affected by the storms and of course out west uh, many fires affecting uh, so many people and not only just in the fire areas but the smoke blooms uh, out, out affecting many people especially breathing problems uh, has far-reaching effects and how blessed we are here at this point in time to not be suffering from any of those, but to please keep everyone that uh, may be affected by that in your prayers. Well, brethren, it is time to begin. So if you will all please rise, I'll ask Mr. Eric Lee to come forward and open our services with prayer. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for this gorgeous Sabbath day, and thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to come together and and worship you on your Sabbath. And Father, thank you for the knowledge you've given us of you and your plan. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of that plan. And thank you for the, the annual feast that you've set apart to, to help teach us and remind us of, of your plan. And thank you for the upcoming holy days and help us to draw close to you and, and learn more about that. And please, Father, inspire the speaking today as well as our hearing and Father, please just be with all your people around the world, and please especially be with those that are sick and those that are facing trials, and please just give them the peace that they need on the Sabbath. And please, Father, please just place your presence here. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, if you'll take your hymnals, turn with me over to page number 76. In the older hymnals, that's page 111 in the, in the uh, newer hymnals. So 76 in the older hymnals. 111 in the new. Um, it does not have an intro, so we will be the intro. Just join in. Uh, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Obviously, somebody put a rest in there that <laughs> wasn't in my book. But uh, anyway, for our second hymn, if you'll turn it over to page number 96. Page number 96, uh, it's 142 in the newer hymnals, 96 in the old, 142 in the new. Sing, unless the Lord shall build the house. Unless the Lord the city shields, the 
God's maintained on useless watch. In vain you rise till morning gray, and late till night he will just be. A bread of anxious care for day, God gives to his beloved sleep. page number 23 in the older hymnals that's page 49 in the newer hymnals 23 in the old 49 in the newer hymnals <clears throat> we'll sing mine eyes upon the lord continually are set message today, Mr. Steve Buchanan. I think Jason set the timer right here in the middle of the lectern so I wouldn't forget to hit the button this time. Hello to all of you. Happy Sabbath to all that are here. Happy Sabbath to those who may be listening in over our call-in line. Hopefully all of you are doing well. I'd like to begin by asking if you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1, context here is just prior to Christ's ascension. Back to heaven, Christ had been resurrected had spent around 40 days with his disciples talking of things, as scripture states, pertaining to the kingdom of God. We're not given any details as far as those conversations are concerned. But we'll begin reading here in verse 4. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And no doubt at this point, Christ is probably tired of hearing the same question. It's always the same from his disciples. Is now the time. Verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times. The Greek word that's translated times is the Greek word chronos, K-H-R-O-N-O-S. And it means a span of time such as a season. So he says you are not going to know a season. You're not going to know the span of time in which I'm going to return. It goes on to say, or seasons. This Greek word is kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. Strong's has this to say about this word. It's an occasion that is set or proper time. The complete word study of the New Testament goes on to say this. There's an opportune time. It is not merely as a succession of minutes, which is chronos, the one Greek word that he just used, but a period of opportunity. There is really no English equivalent to the word kairos, appropriate or opportune time seems to be the best description, when which used in the plural is translated as seasons or times at which certain foreordained events take place. So he's talking about a specific time, is what this Greek word means. In discussing this particular scripture, the complete word study of the New Testament states that it is an allusion to the set time for the coming of the Messiah in his kingdom or for judgment, a specific set time. So Christ says, beginning again in verse 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or a season, or a specific moment in time when I am to return, which the Father has put in his own authority. The specific season, the specific moment in time has been set. The Father has set it. It is within his authority. Despite the 40 days that Christ spent with his disciples following his resurrection to discuss matters pertaining to the kingdom of God, the disciples thought surely at this time, after what Christ had gone through, after his resurrection, after all that they had discussed, they thought surely this was the time. But Christ responds again with a statement that doesn't answer their question. He doesn't tell them when. As we look at that answer from our perspective today, we understand that every single one of them was not going to see the fulfillment of what they hoped for in their physical lifetimes. But the fact that Christ gave here was that they would not know a specific set time. They would not know a season. That was true for them. And as we're going to see by today's study, that is going to be exactly true for all of us. There have been some state that this time is delayed because of various factors including us not being ready, us not being where we should, that Christ's return has been delayed because of us. These verses clearly state that the Father has set a season and a time for Christ to return.
Nothing that we do or don't do will delay what God has set in motion. Christ made a similar statement to the one he made here in Acts chapter 1 back in Matthew chapter 24. We went over this last time, but today I want to go back to this and I want to spend a little more time than I did last time. Matthew chapter 24, we'll begin reading here with verse 36. In Acts chapter 1, they wouldn't know the times or the seasons. Here in verse 36, he states, But of that day, this Greek word is homera, H-E-M-E-R-A, and it means day, daytime, occasion, or time, of that day and hour, the Greek word is hora, H-O-R-A, and it means an hour, a time, season, a definite space or division of time recurring at fixed intervals, figuratively of a season of life, the fresh, full bloom and beauty of youth, the ripeness and vigor of manhood, meaning bloom or beauty, in the New Testament of shorter interval intervals, a time, a season, or an hour. So Christ is stating here of that day and hour, no one knows. They didn't know it, and as Christ is going to reveal, he didn't know it. At least not at the time in which he spoke these words. No one knows not even the angels of heaven, but again emphasizes, but my Father only. My Father knows the day and the hour that it will take place. It is a set point in time that is under the Father's authority. Here in this verse, Christ is referring to the time of his return. The Father knows when it is. How many of God's people, including you, including me, have tried to figure this out? Have tried to look through all of these details? How many sermons that I could go back to my early childhood that I have heard people try to reason and speculate put this scripture together with that scripture here and come up with a time, a date, when this would happen. Verse 37, For as in the days before the flood, Christ is now going to give an example that's going to emphasize what he just said in verse 36, that no one is going to know. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be for his return. Prior to the flood, when you look at this particular verse, life was operating without any cause for concern. The world was operating normally. The economy was operating normally. Perhaps it was in the midst of stress. Perhaps the economy wasn't good. But what they saw was not different than what they were used to. Perhaps the economy was on a major upswing. But again, nothing that they weren't used to seeing. The weather patterns, no different. Lifestyle, practices, crops being grown, the produce being made, everybody working, having a job, life going on. Absolutely no sign that signaled catastrophe on them. No sign. Everything operated as normal 
until the day Noah went into the ark. The time when Noah and the animals, his family, and God sealed the door, until that day there was no sign that the world could see. To the world, there was nothing they could look at that would have pointed them to what, no doubt, Noah had been preaching. They did not feel alarmed. But the emphasis of this verse that it was not until that day that Noah entered the ark did all of a sudden the catastrophe come to the forefront. I want to pause here. That's the world's perspective. What about Noah and his family? Did they have any signs as to when this would occur? If they were given anything, I can't find it. There's nothing in Scripture that states to them on a specific day this is going to take place. But they believed what God had told them, and that belief was put forth with all the years of labor that they had done in preparing the ark, building the ark, and making ready for what God had prophesied was going to take place. But even though that day could not be seen by the world, even though that day I don't feel my speculation that Noah and his family knew until the day God came and said it's time to go into the ark, that's my feeling. I don't feel that the world was not warned about what was going to take place. Again, the faith of Noah was made manifest for everyone to see. Hold your place here and go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're just going to break into the thought and read verse 5. It says, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. This Greek word for preacher is kerux, K-E-R-U-X. And it means a herald. He is to herald a message of divine truth, a proclaimer or a preacher. So Noah, in addition to the work of building the ark, had the role of proclaiming or heralding a message for everyone within earshot to hear. So God, yes, revealed to Noah something that was going to take place. Noah had inside information. But because of that, it was also his responsibility by the example he lived to manifest a proclamation of a message. Noah warned the world of what was going to take place. I believe just as the two witnesses are going to proclaim a warning message, they are, going, they are going to tell the world the need to repent, the need to worship God. I feel Noah was doing the same thing. He was saying, this is going to happen if you don't repent of your evil ways. Noah was giving a message and a warning to everyone who could hear. Back to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 40, after giving this example, that very day in which Noah entered the ark, only then did the world realize what Noah had been saying was true up to that day. Then Christ goes to this. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. 
Two will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. You don't know that specific point in time where Christ is going to return. Christ gives this example, and again, as I read this, I feel the two that are working in the field, the two that he specifies working at the mill, all of them understand the truth. I believe that that is a part of these verses. Of course, if someone doesn't understand the truth, they're not going to be taken. The emphasis is going to be that the two in the field and the two grinding at the mill understand the truth, have been given it, understand it, and realize that their life is supposed to change. It's supposed to grow to the point of mirroring that of Jesus Christ. And Christ states, one will be ready, one will not. How many scriptures, we'll refer to this later, how many scriptures could you readily turn to warning God's people at the end of this age that there will be some or there will be many that will not be prepared for that day when everything begins to happen. I want to try to emphasize something here. This particular moment in time that Christ is emphasizing here in verses 40 to 42, when one is taken and one is left, what is being emphasized as far as that moment in time. We've read scriptures where we will not know the hour or the specific time of Christ's return. I want you to hold your place here and go back to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. All of us know this verse. It says, verse 11, And from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation, or the abomination that causes desolation, is set up or established, and I feel that's talking about established in Jerusalem, there shall be 1,290 days. Are we not told the time and the season of Christ's return? If truly the people of God come to that point in time, will they not know Going back to Matthew chapter 24, I believe that the point that he is talking about here of not knowing is going to be the moment where one is taken and one is not. I believe that is referring to those who will be judged, accounted worthy to go into the place of protection, and others that will be judged not prepared and ready to go. There is coming a time, if we are alive, if we are there in near Jerusalem when the beast power comes down and surrounds the city and establishes itself, if we understand scriptures, we have a 1290 day time frame that God gives. But the specific time in which all the events begin to occur that cannot stop, we will not know it. I want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading here with verse 1. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, these are the same Greek words that were used in Acts chapter 1, chronos and kairos. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Unknown. You're not going to know when everything begins to take place. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. All of the ladies here who have been pregnant know that whenever one is reaching close to the nine-month period, you all know that there's a birth coming. There's absolutely no doubt. But none of you will know the day the birth contractions begin to take place. It's going to be something that all of a sudden it begins to happen, but... Once the contractions begin to take place, there's nothing you can do to stop the birth. I feel that what's being referred to here is once we reach a point in time where the events need to take place, there is no stopping them at that point. God has everything planned down to the day and the hour at which everything is going to take place. Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. All of it begins to happen. Verse 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. It shouldn't happen to us. When that time comes, just like Noah, I feel, was told it's time to get in the ark, all of us have been told, you put a time frame on it. How many years have you been taught? How many years have you known the prophecies that God has revealed from Scripture? All of us. This day should not overtake us as a thief. It doesn't mean that we're going to know when everything begins, but it should not come upon us as a thief. Verse 5, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. One thing that Christ will teach later in today's study is that his followers should not be groping for direction as in darkness, but should be in light. Verse 6, Therefore, another phrase, another comparison, that's a very large part of today's study. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. It's my job to remain alert spiritually, certainly to my condition, but it's not just limited to that. It's being aware of everything that's taking place all around me. It's being aware of all of it. I have to protect myself from everything that is taking place. We should not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. We need to be alert. We need to be diligent spiritually. We need to understand. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. And he's talking about spiritual sleep, spiritual drunkenness, and it all occurs in darkness at night is the allegory that he's using here. Verse 8, But let us who are of the day 
We should be able to see. Light should be illuminating things where we can see where we're going. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith. A large part of this, a conviction and a commitment to God and role, each is to fill by obeying God, becoming trustworthy. Each of those who are of the day, who are following God, will be motivated by faith and love, agape, a godly outlook, a concern as God and Christ feel and are motivated by, they operate by it, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, the prophecies, the goal, all that we've been given are our hope to be part of the family of God and be able to think and love as they do. The three elements given here that God's people will have who will be judged as operating within the light are faith, hope, and love. Those three elements should be motivating God's people. Verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath. He didn't call us for the purpose of experiencing the wrath of God and His judgment. That was not why we were called, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. As we read back in Amos, can two be together unless they are in agreement? We are to be walking with God and Christ step in step. That is our purpose. Verse 11, with all of that being said, with all that we understand concerning end-time prophecies and events, therefore comfort each other and edify one another. Build each other up. Comfort one another. Help each other through the difficult times, just as you also are doing. These words here represent a warning, but they also represent encouragement. God will be there to help us in all that we are required to face, has revealed many things that beforehand that will occur, and he gives us what he expects of us. Each of us will own our own responsibility before God in accomplishing what He requires of us. None of us get to skate free into the kingdom of God. All of us will be required to fulfill our own responsibility. Faith, hope, and love are emphasized as characteristics of those who will actively be following the lead of God through His Spirit. But no matter where we stand, we need to strive to encourage one another to follow God in spite of what circumstances God allows to affect each of us as individuals. Notice the warning of remaining awake spiritually with what Christ is now going to continue with back in Matthew chapter 24. We're up to verse 45. Christ asks a question. Who then is a faithful or trustworthy and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household? Some can read this phrase and think that it applies only to the leadership within the church. The leadership within the church are certainly held to the level that God expects from them. 
But what is described here is the role and the personal responsibility that each person holds within the body of Christ. Who then is that trustworthy and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Again, it's my role in messages to give food in due season. But as each of you find yourselves in positions where you need to comfort or you need to edify one another, you need to supply food in due season to help others that God leads you to understand, that God gives you the understanding to deal from. Verse 46, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Everything will be placed under him. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, as we've said before, there's not very many people I hear actually say those words but by the way they live their life, no longer remaining spiritually alert, but drifting back into practices and customs that are happening all around them, all of a sudden can be eating and drinking in the world and not even realize it. If the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, he begins to let up, he begins to ease up in his preparation and his work and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. Again, the customs and the practices follow. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he's not aware. We just read scriptures that said this time should not overtake us as a thief. God has foretold us what's going to take place. But someone who has the truth and begins to slip back, who's not doing what they are supposed to be doing, can find themselves deceived to the point that they are now in darkness and this day will overtake them as a thief. It will come on them unexpected. Verse 51, And will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The judgment that God speaks of here is going to be one that's going to be heartbreaking for all. To understand. They were given the truth. They were given what they needed, but they didn't use it as expected, and they lost out according to the judgment of God. The emphasis of this example from Christ is the need to be and remain spiritually alert to one's own condition, as well as the signs that God and Christ give concerning what will happen at the end of this age. If any of Christ's followers go to sleep, if they stop watching, if they stop guarding their own condition, and they begin to drift, God says this day can overtake them as a thief in the night. It's not supposed to happen that way, but it can. With that being said, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. All that Christ has given builds on itself. Matthew 25 verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened. So this is a parable. This is not an actual event. This is going to be a parable. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I want to stop here and I want to begin to focus on a few things. 
I feel that the ten virgins are those, I'm going to use it in this example, as those who will be alive at the end of this age. They are going to be present when Christ returns. Why does one need a lamp? We're thinking back in Christ's day. They didn't have electricity. There wasn't a light switch to hit and have the lights come on. But a lamp was needed at night. A lamp was needed to be able to see. In the day when the sun was highest in the sky, they didn't need a lamp. The light coming through the windows gave them what they needed, but it's at night when they need the lamp. This implies that darkness is everywhere and a lamp is needed. We don't have to think hard about what is being described. The spiritual darkness that today we navigate around. Every single day, we're hit on every side, radio, TV, work, in our normal everyday situations, grocery store. What we deal with, there's darkness, teachings all around us that are there to lead us away from what God has given us. How much worse can it get? We certainly need what this represents. How much worse have things gotten over the last five to ten years? Short span of time. How much worse will they get in the coming days ahead of us? However many we have left. The spiritual darkness is what God's people will have to navigate while still proclaiming their example that is supposed to talk of God's purpose for them. The lamp for God's people is an absolute necessity. What does the lamp represent? Hold your place here. Go back to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119. We'll read just verse 105. It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet. God's word, the scriptures that you possess, represent the lamp that is possible to shine light in darkness to help us pave the way our steps. It goes on to say, in a light to my path. The word of God is the lamp. Back in Matthew chapter 25, verse 2. All ten see the need to have a lamp. All ten understand scripture is needed. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Of God's people, again, as I'm using this, alive at the end of the age, some will remain spiritually alert and obey where God's Spirit leads. And as Christ gives this, some will not remain alert and will not follow where God's Spirit leads. Verse 3, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. It appears again, as this is written, all of them had lamps, and probably all the lamps had oil in it. But it talks about taking oil in vessels other than lamps with them to replenish. This parable begins to focus then on the wisdom of having oil. 
We are talking about lanterns back in Christ's day. We're not talking about today's lanterns that operate by a battery that you punch a button and this LED light comes on. We're talking about lamps that have oil that is wicked, that they would have to trim and work the wick to produce as much light as possible. That was the type of lantern that Christ was referring to back in his day. The oil had to be drawn up through the wick to maintain strong light. If there's no oil, there's no light that can be maintained. It can only go as far as the oil will take them. Just having a lamp is not sufficient to navigate your way in darkness. You have to have all of this. So what does it mean that some took oil in their vessels and some did not? All ten were waiting for and understood that Christ was coming. That's the context of this parable. All ten understood and believed that Christ was going to return. All ten were given the scriptures to navigate by. All ten were given what was pictured by the oil, the Holy Spirit that guides and gives what each person needs to understand these words. All ten. What does it mean when it comes to the end and some don't have oil? The foolish took no additional oil with them. Is this speaking that some recognize their need for God's guidance? That some respond to what God gives, follows the lead of the Spirit of God, but the foolish again stop being spiritually alert they begin to participate in customs and practices that's happening all around them so that that day is going to come upon them unexpected, possibly even to the point of quenching the Spirit of God. All of the scriptures we could turn to about the condition of the church at the end of this age. We all know Revelation 3 states that Christ judges that there will be some who believe they have everything they need. They need nothing from anyone else. All their understanding, all of what they grasp from prophecy, they feel satisfied with themselves. And if they need nothing, they're not asking God to replenish that spirit. Their prayers are not the quality that is necessary to go before God. And again, we're going to touch on that aspect as we go forward. Verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now, we began by stating that there is a set moment in time that the Father has definitely established. There is absolutely no way that Christ is going to be delayed from that point in time. But I want to use our own experiences to try to illustrate what this is talking about. Christ cannot be delayed by Satan. He can't be delayed by this world. He can't be delayed by our choices. As I have been attending the church, I have lived through the time when there have been predictions of Christ's return in 1972 and in 1979. Those dates that were speculated came and passed, all of them. We are still here some 38 to 45 years later, whichever of those dates you want to use, and probably as we think about that, none of us thought we would be here in 2017 discussing this stuff, still here, 
But if you're like me and you've lived through that time, how has it affected you? When you came to 1972 or you came to 1979 and you knew this is what's going to happen and it didn't. Notice that this verse states that because it took longer than expected, all ten slept. All ten relaxed from being spiritually alert. All ten let up. They relaxed. What did Christ emphasize at the end of chapter 24? We need to remain spiritually alert and not go to sleep. All of us. From this parable, as Christ is stating it, all of those who will live at the end of this age did not always remain alert like we should. All of us have made mistakes. None of us are innocent. In verse 6, Christ goes on. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. The events are beginning. Go out to meet him. Then all of those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. If all of a sudden you saw God reveal to you that the time was here, what would be your initial reaction? Would it be, make sure your life is in order? Is that what it would be? Or have you been doing it all the way through? The difference in those two perspectives is what Christ is going to talk about now. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish, those who did not take enough oil with them, said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Does this refer, again, speculation, trying to grasp the details it's provided, the end time events begin and those who did not properly remain alert, those who did not prepare and are not ready for it, will they turn to those who remained actively involved in a relationship with God and said, what do we do? Where do we go? How am I supposed to react? And again, put yourself there. If someone asked you that and you had properly prepared, can you give them what they need? The wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go and rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. If that is the case, all ten went to sleep, remember. Five of them, the wise, had to wake up in time to repent, to come back to God, to replenish the oil that was in their lamp so they could clearly see that their life and the example would manifest what God expected from them. Five of them repented and came back. Five of them didn't. The wise here cannot help those who did not prepare spiritually. You don't have to turn there. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, it states this. I counsel you, speaking of those in the church of Laodicea, I counsel you to buy from me. No physical human being is going to be able to provide what they need. They're going to have to go to Christ and to God. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. You're going to have to go through hard times to be purified. They're going to have to go to him for white garments to cover the nakedness that they didn't feel they had. 
And they're going to have to go to Christ and to God for the eye salve they need for the spiritual vision that only God can provide. And I feel at this point it is through the tribulation will be the arena in which they will have to learn these characteristics and attributes. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. One was taken. One was left. Those that were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. We were given the truth. We feel we're ready. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, again, ending this parable, to all that have eyes to see and ears to hear, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. None of us. No, but the emphasis is better be staying close to God and preparing yourself spiritually. Whenever this moment comes, two in the field or two at the mill, God's people functioning as they should everyday life, one will be accepted by God as prepared, one will not be by God has nothing to do with what you feel about yourself, has nothing to do with what you feel about your neighbor. This is God's judgment. Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like, another parable, it's like a man traveling to a far country. And again, we have to place this in the context of when Christ is speaking. The only means of travel they had at that time was by animal, or by boat, or by walking. That was the means of travel. And it says here he was going to a far country. So this is a long journey. There we're talking about a long time. And if we want to try to place this within a framework of what we understand in Scripture, Christ ascended from his disciples there in Jerusalem, he ascended up into the clouds, and how many years will it be before Christ returns? He's gone away a long time. Traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to him. These are servants that worked for him, served him. Verse 15. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Now, I've heard again different speculations as to far as what this is referring to. I've heard some people give this, talk about this, and talk about actual talents or abilities. That's not what this is referring to. A talent is actually a weight is what this is going to refer to. The Greek word is talanton, T-A-L-A-N-T-O-N. Strong's has this to say. It can mean a balance as supporting weights that is by implication a certain weight and thence a coin or a sum of money that equals a certain weight. The complete word study of the New Testament states that the talent was also used as a denomination for money which was reckoned by weight, different sums of local currency were attributed to each monetary talent. I tried to go on the internet trying to research how much is a talent. How can we put it in ways that we can truly understand? I think we understand that back in those days that a day worker could earn a denarius per day. That was a weight of a coin a payment per day. As I tried to research and tried to find out how many denarii are in a talent, there are different speculations out there. And it, can, it, it depends on weight. 
is what we're talking about. But the best that I feel that I could come to, based on the research that I was able to do, that a talent equals roughly 6,000 denarii. To use that comparison and those estimates, if one would work six days a week, taking the Sabbath and holy days off, one worker would earn roughly 300 denarii per year. Based on those estimates, it would take 20 years' wages to equal one talent. And as this parable clearly states, this parable, this talent is money. We're going to see that. What the owner was entrusting to his workers, his servants, had extreme value. They understood how much he was giving to them. We even emphasize the one who had one talent as being maybe lower than the rest. It's not that. Extreme value in one talent of money. Keep in mind, as we're going through all of this, all of this is teaching to his disciples who came to him and asked questions. This is for them. But it didn't stop with just money. Remember what it said after he gave them? It was according each to their own ability. That was how the owner decided how to distribute the money. It was based on his judgment of the ability of his servants. The owner knew and judged the capacity of each person. Do we see today that God has judged each of us and given to us what he has decided we can handle, whether that be revealed truth, whether that be test or trial or circumstance? He knows our capacity. He is constantly in charge. Hold your place here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation, no testing, no hard circumstance has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Not only does God look at us at what we can handle, but he's always on the job to restrict Satan, limiting him to what each can handle based on what God's revealed, based on the physical capacity of each individual. All of this, all of the variables that God uses to judge, he's on the job. And he's making sure that everything is going according as it should. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation or the test will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Perhaps the test that it comes upon you, the fullness of it without God getting involved may be extremely more than you can handle. But at the right time, God will provide a way of escape. God will make the path that you will be able to escape that spot. How many times I have wondered in my own life that I have faced a test or trial, either not waiting for God to prepare the way of escape, or God prepares the way of escape, and I don't recognize it, but yet I want to play MacGyver, and I want to blow a hole in the wall and make my own way of escape, my own reasoning. How many times? God, God could tell me, to the number, how many times I failed that. But it doesn't change the fact that God will entrust to each 
one, what they can bear. And I think that he will test us to the limit of our capacity. He will force us to use what he has revealed to our capacity. We will be tempted. We will be tried. And God will test each of us to see who we will follow. Back to Matthew chapter 25, verse 16. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Again, extreme sums of money, and he worked to double what God had given. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. So these, own, these servants worked to do exactly what the owner gave them to do. Verse 18, But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. We'll get more involved with that one as we go forward. But again, it emphasizes that the talent is money. It is his Lord's money. Verse 19, After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He came to his servants to see what they had done with what he had left. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant trustworthy servant. He did what he was assigned to do. You were faithful over a few things. Consider the extreme value of what he was given. God says you were faithful over a few things. Your reward is I'm going to make you ruler over many things. The reward cannot possibly compare to what he originally gave them, in other words. Enter the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The emphasis in the servants were faithful to the owner. Verse 24, then focuses on the other. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. This word hard is from the Greek word S-K-L-E-R-O-S, -E and it can mean hard tough, or harsh. This is the perspective that this one individual is going to use his reasoning and justification for doing what he did. I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered scattered seed. In other words, you weren't here to do the work, but you're going to come and you're going to take everything that I gained. That's Again, that's the reasoning that's being stated here. He's stating that there's no way the owner is going to be pleased. He's stating that there's no way that he was going to measure up. Verse 25, And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look here, you have what is yours. The reasoning is God's a harsh man. This owner is a harsh man expecting more than I'm able to give putting me in a situation that I can't measure up to. There's no way that I'm going to be able to do what he expects of me. And his reasoning, using that reasoning, was to bury this amount of money in the sand. Verse 26, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. The owner cut through all the reasonings that this one tried to give. He goes on to say, this is the reasoning that you used. 
You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. If you look into some of these words, just in reading that statement, you may think that the owner is agreeing with the assessment of this one worker. You knew that I was this way. That's not what it means. He is seeing the owner and he's going to use this worker's reasonings against him. Notice what he says. If you truly felt the way you said you did, if I was a harsh man and there's no way that you're going to be able to please me, you're not going to be able to measure up with what I expect of you, you ought or you would have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. If that was truly your reasoning, if you were truly scared of me, you would have at least put it to the bankers and I would have had interest. It was, as the owner saw, it was not the reasonings that he used. The worker was lazy. He didn't use what God gave him. He stopped being spiritually alert. He began to drift. He did not do what was assigned to him to do. He was lazy. He did not want to work. Verse 28, therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. Verse 29, we're starting to run out of time. I'm going to try my best to get through this. Verse 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. All of those who do as expected, who actually obey, who actually put to work all that God provides and grows what God had originally given, they will have abundance. God will add to what was originally given. But from him who does not have, that one that does not work, even what he has will be taken away. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Christ is saying there will be some that will not be ready. When he says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that is a definite. This parable talks of the personal responsibility each of us have. Whatever role God has assigned to you, you are going to have to work using what God provides. You are going to have to remain humble and asking God to replenish the spirit you need to guide and to make live the words of the lamp, the words that God has given us. We are going to have to understand that. If we have not fully repented, we must fully repent and be spiritually alert going to God for what we need before that day occurs when the events are going to begin to happen. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, Christ begins to talk about here after his return and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So this is going to be talking as we begin this parable of Christ on his throne, perhaps ruling during the millennium, perhaps ruling during the last great day. But it's going to talk about the judgments of Christ. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The judgments of Christ as ruler. Still, in that time, they are going to be required to do what God expects. Sheep from the goats, most of the time when you think of that, most of the time when I think of that, a sheep heeds the voice of the shepherd Sometimes they're a little dumb. Sometimes you've got to work with them to do what you need them to do. And boy, is that the case for me at times. But it also refers to goats. And lots of times goats are one who want to go off to do their own thing. 
That's what I see when I think about this. But the emphasis on the judgment of Christ. If you want to write in your notes, John 5, 22 through 27, it states that the Father has assigned Christ to be judge, and he is entitled there as being made judge, verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. He experienced everything in this life. Who better to judge mankind than one who experienced it all and passed every single test? Verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, to the sheep, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger, or take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And I can only imagine the sheep who were doing God's bidding, who no doubt were growing in humility through their conversion, were asking this question from the perspective, when did I ever do that to you? A very humble response. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In other words, those who received the lamp and the oil that came with it used it for the purpose that God had determined and was motivated by faith, hope, and love. It was all built in them. Verse 41, Then he will also say to those on his left hand, the goats, Depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devils and his angels. They're not going to burn eternally, but this fire is going to consume them. Verse 42, For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And I can just think of the goats who did not do as God said, whose mind is not of that of a humble nature, are going to ask this question with a completely different attitude behind it. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? If we would have seen that, we would have been there. and did not minister to you. that he will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. In other words, you were lazy. You had every instruction and every expectation given to you, and you chose not to work to do it. You didn't sacrifice for the benefit of someone else. Verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This brings us to the end of the Olivet Prophecy. Keep in mind, even though we took several messages to try to go over this in a little more detail than perhaps normally we do, the Olivet Message comprised one conversation based on a series of questions that Christ's disciples asked to him. How long did it take for Christ to state these words? How long was this sermon that we refer to it as, this conversation, how long did it actually happen? Christ also understood the capacity of his disciples at that time. They had not received his spirit yet. They understood a, a surface understanding, but depth of which they never got. It was given for the purpose for the spirit to bring it to remembrance so they could write it and preserve it for those that would come after them. We are beneficiaries of the teachings 
and the warnings that are included in this message. This teaching and warning is just as applicable to us today as it was the original disciples that he gave it to. We have been entrusted with the truth. We have been assigned roles for Jesus Christ to act out in this life to teach righteousness. And it's going to require work. We are not going to be able to skate easily into the kingdom of God. Each of us will have to own up to our own individual responsibility that God has assigned to us. Each of us are being tested and judged today. For all who have been given the Spirit of God, there are no exceptions to that. In addition to what we all understand written in Revelation 3 to the church of Laodicea, there are so many other scriptures we could turn to besides what we have covered here in Matthews 24 and 25 that talk about people within the church of God and at the end of this age will not be prepared for what's going to take place. We must take heed to the warnings that God is giving us. I have to take heed to the warnings and the role that God has given me to fulfill, just as you have to. It is serious. Final scriptures, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. How better to end this than with another parable? Verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. We always ought to pray, but you need to stop and you need to consider what kind of a prayer are you offering. Is it in humility or is it half-hearted? Is it truly fervent before God? Do you truly see your need? Do you truly see yourself as one lacking that needs the Spirit replenished? Or are you one who are satisfied with who you are and can offer a prayer in that perspective as well? He spoke this parable to them that men always ought to pray in the right way and not lose heart, not grow discouraged, not get depressed, not think to themselves, I can't do this. I'm something small without understanding what God says in Scripture. He will supply what every single person needs and will monitor the life of every single person and will protect and make possible what he expects out of each individual. That is, that is a given. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, nor regard man. In other words, a person in the world with a position of authority. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with him? In other words, you may have prayers lots of times that are going to mirror what this widow said. Please get justice for me. But things don't happen as quickly as we think they should. We have to go through things that perhaps we don't feel we certainly don't want to go through, but each test and each trial is purpose of purification from God's perspective. But even here, I want to notice both perspectives. 
One from the human level, from the widow, being tried and tested severely in a world, in a dark world, of, from being guided and ruled by people who do not have God's truth, are not motivated by faith, hope, and love, but are motivated by greed, striving to remain faithful in those circumstances. It's hard and it's trying, but God's perspective is one that he knows all that's happening to this widow. It is according to his purpose for each individual, but his perspective also will include extending patience and long-suffering with each of us when there are times that we may not measure up and do exactly like we should. Perhaps you too will play MacGyver and try to blow a hole in the wall and make your own path that seems right to you instead of waiting for God. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, but it will be in God's time. It will not be just because we pray for it. I think of the time in which we live, and it's already been mentioned. We've got fires in the northwest. We've got an earthquake just to the south of our border. We have a flood that came up that hit Texas and Louisiana, dumped a mountain of rain, flooding and damage, hardship. We have a hurricane that's coming up from the Florida, and there's another one brewing that could follow it. What is God doing to this country? What will he require of his people when these things begin to occur? What will the attitude of his people be if they are personally affected? It's not just about stating a prayer and telling God, asking God to rebuke the storm. Perhaps he would, perhaps that's in his plan. But it appears to me that God is taking away the blessings from the nation and the descendants of Israel because he favored them and he gave them blessings beyond everyone else. And he's going to punish us for our sins as a country. We cannot shirk from what God has assigned to us no matter the situation or the circumstance that he allows to affect each of us as individuals. If something happens to you, do you ever think that God's not aware of it? Do you think that it doesn't have purpose? All of it does. It's not about how much money we have. It's not about how nice our home is, how many cars we have, how much money we have. Nothing of that. It's what is truly of value, the pearl of great price. Will we compromise it? Will we shirk from what God has told us to do? Will we grow lazy and not work to try to grow as God has? has assigned to each of us. The end of verse 8, Christ asks the question, Nevertheless, even though I'm going to fulfill every promise, I'm going to answer prayer speedily, when the time comes, it's going to happen. All of that being given, when the Son of Man comes, when He returns, will He really find faith on the earth? Will he find people that are trustworthy given the darkness that they're going to have to navigate at the end of this age? Keep in mind, we're looking at this dark world now. This is not the world that's going to exist at the end of this age. The deception, the lack of peace, the famines, the disease, the natural disasters, all of which are going to climax in a time that's unlike any that's happened before or that ever will happen again. A time unlike any other. Will the people of God be prepared if one has to endure that? We are approaching the fall holy days again this year. It will begin 
with the Feast of Trumpets. The judgment of God. As I consider this study, my question that I ask myself, how ready am I? I think if you truly ask yourself that question, none of us are where we think we should be. All of us should probably be further along than what we are. But like the ten virgins still today, each of us have opportunity to fully repent, fully turn to God and apply ourselves and work a style of life that Jesus Christ lived himself. That is the mission that God has given us. This sermon, this message that Christ gives includes encouragement, it includes instruction and teaching, and it includes warnings for His people. That's who this is directed to. It's not directed to the world. It's directed to you and me. How will we respond? Think of these things as the fall holy day approach. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Brethren, if you'll take your hymnals, stand with me for one last song today. Turn over to page number 53 in the older hymnals. That's page number 79 in the newer hymnals. Following this, we will be led in the closing prayer by Mr. Anderson. And then we will have some local announcements to follow. So 53 or 79, O oh God, forsake me not. Loving Father, Almighty God, we come before you at the close of the service, Father, uh, again to thank you so very much for the, the peace, the safety, the fellowship that we have here. We know that it is quite a blessing, great God, and we thank you so much for that. We pray now, Father, that you will help us to really understand the extreme value in the truth that you have revealed to us, the precious knowledge of your plan your very nature, who you are and what you are about. Help us to guard that. Help us to seek your guidance, great God, always. Help us to grow in, in strength and in the knowledge of your word. Help 
us to understand it more and more each day. Help us to stay close through prayer. That is where our communion with you is, great God. Pray, Father, that we not be like that lazy servant, that we put forth the effort that you would have us to put forth to, to grow in the, the love, the hope, the truth that we need in these, in these dire, dark days, great God. So we just pray that you would help us to heed the warnings, to understand your teaching more and more, draw close with one another, and certainly with you and our elder brother. We do thank you again for this message. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for this season that we're in, great God. And we pray and ask that you would be with your people, that you would protect us in our travels, and you would dismiss us in grace. In Jesus Christ's most holy name we pray.